Hi, I'm Maimon. Welcome back to another video in our series of converting our patio to a three-season sunroom. And at this point in the construction, we're trying to enclose the patio to make it more of a multi-purpose room. So it's not going to be a sunroom anymore. It's going to be, it could be a computer room. It could be a fitness room. We don't know yet, but we're trying to enclose it because as you'll notice, there are bugs. So to prevent these bugs from pulling up in the sunroom, because now it's spring, we're going to enclose the room. And part of that is setting up the floor. It's important to remember that with these videos, we're not master carpenters or builders, so these videos won't be a how-to. They're mostly about showing you how we're trying to do things uh, and hopefully get some tips from you guys in the comments. But when converting a patio to a sunroom and enclosing a room, everything's important. Like, you know, of course you want to have walls and studs, but probably the most important part of a room is the floor because everyone's going to be standing on the floor. In a previous video, we already gone over the footing, these concrete foundations for the room, and now we're going to talk about what goes on top of them, joists. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to pick the right joists for your room. So when talking about a floor, you have to consider two things, namely weight and length. In our case, we have a room that's about 17 feet by 11 and a half feet. But we also need to make sure that the floor holds a reasonable amount of weight. So in our case, we need to hold about 30 to 40 pounds per square foot of uh, live load and, or dead load. Uh, according to my dad, apparently the specifications for live load is different than dead load. I should know the difference between them and I, uh, why they're different, but um, I can't remember it right now. But just thinking about it, doesn't it, like, intuitively it doesn't make sense why live load might have a different specification than a dead load. But I do know why it isn't, I just can't remember it right now. But anyway, we have to choose the right size of joists and the right length so that they can be supported while still making sure, I, so that the weight can be supported while still making sure that it's long enough to fit the room. So the dimensions we chose for our joists are two by, uh, by eight. It's actually one and a half by seven and a half because they cut down the wood because people are cheap. Well, why choose a two by eight rather than let's say this, Two by six. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video. So there are specifications based on the size of the wood and the length of the span that you want to cover, what type of wood you should use, or what length of wood you should use. And it's right behind me, right here. So based on your material, for example, you have Southern Pine or Douglas fir, and the spacing of your joists. It'll tell you the maximum length that you can span your joists. So in my case, we have a two by eight and the spacing that we've chosen is 16 inches. According to this guide, the maximum span is 11 feet and 10 inches. And actually the rule for these, the, the, the common rule of thumb is that usually you'll take the, uh, the the thickness or the height of the wood in inches, and in, in our case we have eight inches. Then you want to multiply it by one point five uh, or one and a half, and then you want to add a foot onto the end of that. So in our case we have eight times one and a half is twelve. Twelve feet is gonna be the span for our two by eight, but that only applies in our case because we have the southern pine. There are different rules of thumb for different materials. So in our case, we have uh, 11 feet and 10 inches is our maximum span. And like I said earlier, the width of this room is 11 and a half. And actually, the length of this joist is, I'm not going to measure it, 
it's 10, <laughs> 10 feet and 8 inches. So we just barely uh, covered the entire span of the roof. But if you want to cover a longer distance than is allowed for by the cantilever, you have, I mean, by the, uh, by the uh, guidelines, you have two options. You can either put it on a cantilever or you can decrease the space between the joists. So first off for spacing, uh, hopefully there's gonna be an overlay. You can decrease the spacing. Instead of using 16 inches, you can use a 12 inch spacing. And that will allow you to support a longer span according to the guidelines. The other option is to use a cantilever. So the previous guidelines specify the span between two points that are supported. Between this footing and that footing, uh, if I was pointing at a footing, the maximum span between them would be 11 feet and 10 inches. However, if you use a cantilever, you can add an extra fourth of the length of the wood onto either end of the span, which means that if we take this as our new footing, we can have an extra fourth of the length on each side of this span, which allows us to increase our uh, our total span to more than 11 feet and 10 inches. So for sake of clarity, an example would be between these two footings and that footing over there, the maximum span is going to be 11 feet and 10 inches. However, if we treat this footing and that footing, as our new uh, footings, then we can actually add a cantilever on one side to increase that by a quarter of 11 feet and 10 inches, which would be, which would get us to about 12 feet. And this is only on one side. We can add a cantilever that increases our, our width by uh, a quarter on one side. We can also do that on the other side which means that we can increase our total length or, or span to about 14 feet total. However, this doesn't usually apply for decks that are attached to the house, because if it's attached to the house, that means that one side isn't gonna be a cantilever, which means that your maximum span for a cantilever will usually be just an extra quarter. It won't be an extra two quarters. All right, so with all the cantilevers out of the way, I have to admit, I'm not the best teacher for this kind of stuff, so you can check out other videos if you want to learn more about it. I'm gonna tell you about what we're doing, because that's what we came here for. So it's a vlog. And in our last video, I talked about how we're laying down the footings. And if you want to check out more about that, you can always go check it out. These footings go down 42 inches, and they have concrete in them. And before, we plan to put, we, we plan to only lay six footings. One, two, three, four, five, six. However, my dad was thinking that, you know, during parties, kids that might come in here and they might, there might be tons of kids dancing in this room. So this room might not, this floor might not be able to support the weight of tons of kids dancing. So he decided to add another uh, footing and this one, this one's actually made of metal instead of uh, concrete, uh, right here and over here as well. So he added those additional footings just in case um, the six footings that we already have could not support the weight. All right, so next I want to talk about themes. So usually when you're building a deck, what's that sound? Okay, usually when you're building a deck, usually have uh, joists go on top of beams and they go in sort of a crisscross pattern. However, we can't do that because uh, this is a bit, too low, a bit too low to the ground for us to put beams under the joists. So instead of using beams under the joists, we're actually putting beams on the sides and these are called flush beams. What is that sound? And these Flush beams uh, ensure that you, know, you you still get 
Sorry, I can't focus because it's... So, having flush beams essentially serves the same purpose as beams under the joists, but instead of being under the joists, they're on the side. Uh, I, po I apologize for the noise, it's spring, people are working. Uh, but in order to make sure that this, is, this flush beam is strong enough, we actually paired it up uh, and made, the, made two beams next to each other. And this is called sistering, when you put two beams next to each other in order to uh, reinforce the strength. And uh, we actually didn't have a uh, piece of wood that was 17 uh, feet long. So as you can see, we actually uh, just lined them up end to end. It's actually better that we did this too because these are this is actually essentially two decks put together. It, you'll see that if you cut this in half right here, this is a deck and this is a deck. So what we've just done here is we've used this, we've used the flush beam to connect these two decks into one. So these pieces of wood on this side of the patio, they are beams, but they're not beams in the same way that those are flush beams. These are called headers or ledgers, and when you're building a deck, usually you're supposed to attach it to the side of the house. And that's what these header or ledger beams would be for. In this case, you wouldn't have to double them up because you're attaching them to the side of the house. In our case, we're attaching them to these railroad ties, which essentially serves the same purpose. But I just want to make the distinction between these headers and ledgers and these flush beams, which I think is a very cool distinction. All right, so I have to go now. But in this video, we talked about footings, framings, and joist sizes for a suspended floor for a deck, for a floating deck in our case. And in our next video, I'm gonna be talking about how to put these um, joist hangers on the side of the beams. And I'll see you there. But for now, I have to go to an appointment. So I'm Ayman, and thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and look at our videos on I and Ayman, especially the videos on converting our patio to a multi-purpose room. And me and Burton, we'll see you there. But for now, signing out. Peace. Have a good night.